Um, let, why don't we, actually, why don't we start with a word of prayer? God, as we seek to explore this extraordinary universe today, we pray that your spirit would give us wisdom and that your grace would bring us closer together. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm going to be talking for the next hour or so about science and religion. And I just want to, I guess, first thing I want to do is make uh, a statement that I'm not a scientist. I think that's important to get that out of the way. Um, I will be approaching this subject as a minister, uh, but someone who's very interested in science. And I, I just sort of find myself reading a lot in this field. And there's been some really exciting work done in the intersection of science and religion over the last 20 years. So there's some wonderful things to read right now. But I've also noticed that as people, as I meet people who are interested in, the, in faith, that science often is one of the stumbling blocks. So perhaps they're interested in God, they have questions about faith, but they, for some reason, they have the understanding that science has disproven God. Or you know, now that we have science, there's no need for God. Or even if you want to believe in God, it's just a fantasy, science has proven that. And so I'd like to explore questions like that. And before I dive in, I, I sort of wanted to gauge where people are coming from. I know we have at least a few working scientists in the audience, but I'm sure we have other people who are at least interested in these fields. Does anybody have any initial impression they'd like to share? Perhaps you've struggled with reconciling these two areas. Is it a live question for you? Anybody? I don't want to be first. Okay, Bill. <laughs> the more I study it and read it, and I think you're right, uh, a lot of new interesting information. I feel like the intersection between the two is getting clearer and clearer. Okay. That many prominent scientists believe in a higher power, whether it's defined as God or not. Um, and I think that it's not easy, but I think it can be reconciled with science. And okay. So we start on an optimistic note. <laughs> Sci some scientists that you know about are reconciling these, and it's possible, but not easy. And Andrea, what, what were your, was your well, comment? I, was say, I think for a long time, people thought religion started where science ended, so that the more people knew, it was always the things they didn't understand. Yeah. But I feel like scientists tend to feel that the more they understand, the more amazed they are that yeah. things have gone the way that they are. So I'm going to repeat that. This is a great point, and I was going to touch on this anyway. What Andrea is, is uh, saying is what's often called the God of the gaps argument. So in other words, God is all that stuff we don't yet understand. But once we do understand it, we no longer need God. So a great example is the Greeks believed in the god Helios, who would carry the sun around the earth every day. Well, once you understand that the sun is a flaming star out in the universe, you don't need that God anymore. And as you slowly chip away at these various ideas, you, know, just, you, you need religion less and less. And I agree with you that I don't think that's a fair description, certainly not of the Judeo-Christian God that we'll be focusing on today. I wanted to start with a, with a photo. Oh, sorry. Yes, Mary Frances. Uh, well, my father was a scientist. Okay. And so I loved him, so I loved science. And uh, he was a chemist, but he was really interested in nuclear um, mm -hmm. physics. And at the time, there was a program called Atoms for Peace. Okay. <laughs> you see how that worked out. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, but I, but I also, he was also creative. I think we have to use both sides of that. Okay, we're going to get into that. So let, hold that thought. So this is a photograph from the new James Webb telescope. I'm sure some people have read about. Uh, this is the Carina Nebula. It's located about 7,500 light years away from Earth. It's a cloud of interstellar dust. And I think the first thing to observe is that it's stunningly beautiful. So we're already sensing that nature has a certain beauty to it. What, the other thing I want to say about this telescope is that it serves no practical purpose. This telescope does not cure poverty. It does not figure out how to cure diseases. It does not end war. So why was it built? It, they, it was it cost over $10 billion to build it. It took over 17 years as a consortium of countries from Europe and, and North America, spending all this time and money into building something that literally has no practical purpose. Yes, Bill, would you have a question? Yeah. No, I don't have a larger purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's right. what scientists were 
fascinated by can we see further back? Because it seems farther is, is, is more past, right? Absolutely. So, so figuring out the early, yeah. perhaps the early story of the universe, that's true. Again, I would question whether there's any practical yeah, purpose of that. And, and yeah, Jim. There may not be a practical purpose now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so there could be a practical purpose in the future. Right. Simon? One of the conspiracy theories I have is that they can turn around the camera and look at us. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So they'll throw that out there too. Possible surveillance. Um, um, okay. So, I mean, so when I say it has no practical purpose, that is not meant at all as a criticism. In fact, it's, it's actually something that's good. So what I want to suggest is the purposes that went into building this telescope are beautiful purposes. I think, number one, it's, it's that we have a desire to know the truth. We want to know what's out there. We want to know what the story is, as Bill was saying, about our early origins. And then the second is that there's an inherent feeling of mystery and awe when we look out at the heavens. And so it's not a strike against this at all that it has no practical purpose. In fact, um, Henri Poincaré, who was a French scientist, he said a scientist does not study nature because it is useful. He studies it because he delights in it, and he delights in it because it is beautiful. If nature were not beautiful, it would not be worth knowing, and if nature were not worth knowing, life would not be worth living. Now, he's French, so that explains a little bit of what he's saying, <laughs> but I also think he's getting at something quite true, that the impulses that drive science ultimately are not quantitative impulses, it's a desire for beauty. It's a desire to explore mystery. And I would argue that those same impulses are what have animated people to seek out God since the origin of time. And here's uh, Psalm 8. You can imagine someone in the ancient world, how clear the sky probably was back then with no light pollution, looking up at the heavens, feeling awe, and saying, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? So I would suggest to you that perhaps the same impulses that drove the psalmist to have these questions are still working in scientists who build telescopes like this. Alice, did you have a question? No, I was just going to reiterate that, you know, the people perhaps with the telescope, yeah. Right. Yeah, curiosity. Oh, asking the why question, which we're going to talk about actually more in a few minutes. So what might surprise people, because I, I think nobody has really raised the fact that there does seem to be, at least publicly, there's a divide between science and religion. And there, I think that conversation has become more and more polemical in the last 20 years as we've had some very prominent atheists coming out and writing books and having publicity campa campaigns in which they... Uh, really mock religion and, and um, say that if you, you know, if, you, if you believe in religion, you're really believing in fairy tales and you need to wake up and, um, and you know, get rid of that illusion. And so it might surprise people how closely science and religion have been connected through history. So I want to take a little bit of a tour through the scientific revolution. This was the period from around 1500 to around 1700 in which there was an unprecedented explosion in discovery and progress in the world of science. Nothing, and I really want to stress this, nothing had ever been seen like this before. There really wasn't a formal empiricism, which is people uh, conducting tests on nature before then. There was a lot of philosophy, a lot of people thinking, like looking at the stars and thinking about them, but there was, really was no empiricism. That started in the scientific revolution, and all of the people who were deeply involved in that were men of faith. So we start with Copernicus, who was the first person to really put out the idea that the sun was the center of the universe, not the earth. And he says, to know the mighty works of God, to comprehend his wisdom and majesty and empower, to appreciate and degree the wonderful working of his laws, surely all of this must be pleasing and acceptable, uh, must be a pleasing and acceptable mode of worship to the most high God. So what he's saying here is that his scientific discoveries in his mind are actually a form of worship. A generation later, we have Galileo, brilliant scientist, was really the first person to use a telescope to not just the naked eye, but to look into the stars with a telescope. 
He said the laws of nature are written by the hand of God in the language of mathematics. Now, Galileo is often a talking point for atheists who say, yeah, but didn't he get in trouble with the church? And we can, tell, we can talk about that story. It's a lot more complicated than people think. The short story is that the church had its own scientists, and it was those scientists who disagreed with Galileo because they were still holding on to an Aristotelian view of the world, not a more modern empirical view of the world. And that was the case for most scientists. It wasn't just a, a church idea. He also uh, angered the pope by writing a satirical book mocking him. So that also got him in trouble. <laughs> so um, Johannes Kepler, he was the first person to discover that the orbits of planets were elliptical and not circular. Again, Aristotle, because Aristotle didn't start with empiricism, he started with rational ideas, said, well, orbits have to be pure circles because that's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But Kepler actually began looking at the orbits of stars through telescopes and he found out they were elliptical. And yet for him as well, this was an act of faith. He said the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God. And now we come to who was widely regarded as the greatest scientist in history. He, this was Einstein's hero, Isaac Newton, endlessly brilliant devout Christian, spent as much time studying theology as he did studying science, invented calculus, was the first person to describe the laws of gravity. He says the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. So my first question is, does this surprise anybody? Do people already know this? It doesn't surprise Doesn't surprise you at all? I mean, I think the, the point that I'm trying to make here is not just these scientists happen to be Christians. It's that if we talk about science and religion being two different fields, for these people, it was absolutely the same. In other words, when they, they were doing science, they thought that they were discovering things about God, right? The more they discovered about God's laws, they were sort of peering through the veil to see what God was actually doing behind the scenes. Yes? I think it, uh, very similar. I, I studied neuroscience in college, and I'm going to be a neurosurgery resident here at Jefferson. And the, the deeper I went into science, the more perfect you find that it is, the more you're convinced that there's no possible way that this could be done without some sort of intelligent being. There's actually a really interesting uh, article, I think it was Wall Street Journal, called Science Increasingly Making the Case for God. And it's like, the idea is that if you apply the scientific method, if you, uh, if you think empirically about the probability of the absolute perfection of quantum physics and then physics on top of that and then organic chemistry on top of that and then biology and then evolution and life and us being able to think and communicate with each other and love and listen to music and see art. It's, from a scientific perspective, it's, it's completely improbable that it, it would have happened by chance. Yeah. So the more I studied science, the more it was actually a really important thing for me in my faith journey was taking more science classes and learning more about science. Tell me your name again. Keenan. Keenan. So did everybody hear Keenan? And first of all, you're going to be a neurosci neuroscientist, you said, or neuro surgeon. surgeon, neurosurgeon. Okay. Yeah. That was beautifully put. And I mean, a lot of your points we're going to talk about today. So I, I'm grateful that you have, I, I, be, I want to listen to your more insights as we go. The complexity argument is going to be one that we talk about today. Um, I want to, but I just, it's funny, this is a very receptive audience, so uh, I, I, don't have, I don't really have to convince you, but I do want to at least raise, raise the point that there is a lot of polemicism right now by sharing a little bit of what some prominent scientific materialists are saying. So, oh, actually, what, no, one more. This is Kelvin, from which we get the uh, Kelvin temperature reading. As the depth of our insight into the wonderful works of God increases, the stronger are our feelings of awe and veneration in endeavoring to approach their author. Okay. But then we get today to somebody like Steven Weinberg, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979. He says, the world needs to wake up from the long nightmare of religion. Anything we scientists can do to weaken the hold of religion should be done, and it may in fact be our greatest contribution to civilization. And this is really not an uncommon view. One thing that strikes me about this statement is it's a little scary. Anything we can do reeks a little bit of totalitarianism. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, he's not thinking in that direction. But um, 
one thing that's interesting when we see scientists beginning to enter the public debate stage is that sometimes they move outside of their area of expertise. So Steven Weinberg is a brilliant physicist. I would trust everything he says about physics, but he's not talking about physics right now. He's exiting that arena to talk about religion. And so you have to ask the question. In fact, this will be a very scientific question. What is your expertise on which, what are you basing this opinion on? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. Yep, I'm sure he is. Damage has been done. And I think he's probably also, and this is a very important point, you have to ask people what kind of a God are you talking about? He's probably thinking, oh, Christians who say evolution never happened. Christians who say the world was created in seven days. Christians who believe there were never any dinosaurs or Noah's Ark, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Valid criticisms, but it's not a very scientific statement to wrap all of these people into one category and dismiss them all. Yes, Mary Frances. She's a cynicism in his eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I can't. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think he had, I don't know whether Weinberg was Jewish or just German. Oh, oh, thank you, thank you. But I think that, um, that he had a bad time in the synagogue of the church. Right. <laughs> Who, who knows? I mean, I don't want, again, I, want to, I, I don't want to commit the same fallacy of making statements outside my knowledge base. So, right. yeah, Bill. Is he talking about organized religion? I think so. In other words, yeah. you can criticize organized yeah. religion for yes. a lot of reasons yes. throughout history. Yeah. But if you're talking about faith, that's a different issue. Right. Good point. And we're actually going to talk about that in just a moment. So a couple other statements. So here is Stephen Hawking. Again, brilliant. Unbelievably brilliant, never won the Nobel Prize, could have. Uh, trust everything he says about physics. But he later in his life decided to exit the world of science and begin writing books about more philosophical questions. Uh, it came out later that he didn't really have much of a background in philosophy. But he nonetheless made statements like this, there is no God, no one directs the universe. Now here's the problem with this statement. Is this a scientific statement? Is, this, is it possible to test this statement? It's not, it's, this is not a scientific statement. This is a statement of opinion. But here's what happens. When Stephen Hawking says something like this, people take it seriously because this is Stephen Hawking, absolutely brilliant scientist. People, you know, the layperson says, he's, Stephen Hawking says God doesn't exist. I mean, I guess God doesn't exist. Here's another uh, person. Some of you remember the show Cosmos, Carl Sagan, Does anybody? So do you remember the how he started that show yeah. and he and he said he said this phrase which is a very poetic phrase the cosmos is all that is or was or ever will be it's a nice poetic phrase but how does he know this this is not a scientific statement and again I don't want to I, I don't want to do any ad hominem attacks on people I just want to I just want to sort of turn the question back on them. Is this something that you can know? Is it possible to know this? Okay, so the, the quote that I like to remind people of when it comes to things like this is by Richard Feynman, also a brilliant physicist. He said, outside of their particular area of expertise, scientists are just as dumb as the next person. <laughs> so uh, I think that pretty much says it all. This, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay, so I, let, there's another slide. I think maybe it might even be the next slide. Let's see something. Um, uh, here's what I think they mean. I think they're expressing um, a philosophy of naturalism. This is also sometimes called scientific naturalism, and it basically means that the only thing that's real is physical matter and energy. Right, it's, a, it's materialism. That's all. That there's, there's, there is no supernatural reality. Everything that exists is simply natural. But there's no spirit. There's no spirit, right? Um, but the problem is that can't be. That statement can't be tested. That statement is based on a philosophical assumption about the world. Now it may be, may or may not be true, but it's an. A, you ever heard this word a priori? It's an a priori assumption, which is a faith claim. I, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here. 
But that is a faith claim. If something can't be proven, by nature it's a faith claim. Now they would be loath to admit that, but this naturalism, this, this assertion that all that exists is, is material reality can't be tested or proven. Now, I wanted to just back up to uh, say that, that despite the polemicism, there really are plenty of working scientists who are people of faith. And I've seen studies that say about half of scientists actually are people of faith. And Bill Phillips was an also a Nobel Prize winner, and he says being an ordinary scientist and an ordinary Christian seems perfectly natural to me. It is also perfectly natural for the many scientists I know who are also people of deep religious faith. And I'm sure a lot of people in the room can relate to that. Now, here's what I want to say about this. I don't think there really is a, a conflict between science and religion. Because Bill Phillips is a Christian and he's a working scientist. I presume the scientific method he's using is every bit as robust as an atheist scientist. From a single I'm sorry? You're generalizing from a single instance. Well. Hear me out. What I'm saying is that if it's possible to be a believing Christian and do science, it means there's no, conf there's no inherent conflict between science and religion. So, am I, are you following me? Mm -hmm. You can be an atheist and you can do science. You can be religious and do science. So the conflict is not between science and religion. The conflict is between two worldviews, one that promotes atheism and one promotes theism. Does that make sense? And atheism essentially is analogous with uh, naturalism. So we can use those terms interchangeably. Naturalism would always indicate atheism. So I want to spend the rest of our talk looking at a few myths that I think um, some people believe because they've accepted this idea that there's a conflict between science and religion. And I hope that in exploring them we can expose that these really aren't true. The first myth is that there are no limits to scientific discovery. Meaning science can explain everything. Um, and a good proponent of this is Peter Atkins. He's a chemist. He writes a lot of textbooks. He's from Oxford. Uh, he, you can look him up. He's done some public debates about atheism and religion. And he says there is no reason to expect that science cannot deal with any aspect of existence. I do not consider that there is any corner of the real universe or the mental universe. Is that trash getting picked up? Is that what that is? Okay, let's just let's hang, let's hang out for one minute then. <laughs> Um, okay, so what, what Peter Atkins is saying is that science, it, it, if there is knowledge out there, the only way that we're really going to be able to access it is through science, and there's, there's no reason to think that there's any limit to that. So there's no corner of the real universe or the mental universe that's shielded from science's glare. I want to investigate that claim and see if he's right, uh, because none other than Isaac Newton would dispute him, because Isaac Newton would say, Gravity explains the motions of the planets, but it cannot explain who sets the planets in motion. So he says there is a limit. Science can certainly describe gravity, but science cannot tell you who created gravity in the first place. And um, one of Atkins' colleagues at Oxford put it a different way. It was Peter Medawar wrote a book. He won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. He wrote a great book called The Limits of Science. And he says that there, that there is indeed a limit upon science is made very likely by the existence of these questions that children ask. How did everything begin? What are we all here for? And what is the point of living? And his point is that these are questions that everybody asks, but that science is not capable of answering. So I want to I test this by a few, a few examples. So the first one is an example of a kettle. Why is the kettle boiling? So you walk into the kitchen, and there's, and by the way, I didn't make this, these analogies up. I'm borrowing this from a great mathematician named John Lennox at Oxford. He says, you walk into the kitchen, and there's a kettle uh, on the stove and the water's boiling. And you ask, why is this happening? And a scientist could easily tell you all about the physics of it. The heat is being transferred to the metal and the metal is exciting the molecules of water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That is a perfectly reasonable answer to the question, why is the kettle boiling? But there's another answer. Why is the kettle boiling? Because somebody wanted a cup of tea. <laughs> That's also true, isn't it? Are those two explanations at odds? No, they're complementary. You see, science and religion can work together. Because if you extrapolate that out to the universe, you might say, well, there's probably one day, I don't know if this is likely, but let's say one day science is able to tell us exactly how the universe works, right? All, how all matter came into being and where it's all going. That still wouldn't answer the question, well, why is it there in the first place? 
Are you following me? All right, now we come to the moral category. Say we have a gun. If you're a physicist, you could certainly explain the mechanics of how a gun works. You could talk about the, the trigger firing and the gunpowder exploding and the, you know, the ballistics going through the air and maybe even piercing someone's skin and you could calculate the velocity of that. But you couldn't answer this question. Should you pull the trigger? Also a very important question, maybe a more important question. And from this example, we could talk, we could spend the rest of the day actually talking about this. Can science explain morality? Can science give us a moral code? I would argue it can't, but there are some people who've tried to do that. One of the, one of the polemicists I'm thinking of when I talk about how polemical things are is this guy, Sam Harris who wrote a book called The Letter to the Christian Nation. Uh, he's not really a scientist, but he's, he's, I guess he's more of a philosopher. He has tried to make the case that science can give us morals, but it's a really tough case to make. Do you wanna talk about that or is that interesting to people? All right, so, well let's, okay, let's from a naturalistic standpoint, let's talk about natural selection, evolution. People familiar with natural selection, how it works in evolution. All right. Well, natural selection is based on environmental pressures, which not, they don't just affect, affect our bodies, they affect, presumably, our minds, our behaviors, our beliefs, our morals. If you're a strict atheist, Dar, Dar, you know, Darwinist, you would say whatever beliefs we have are a product of evolution because everything is natural. So that means if you're in one part of the world, you may evolve in a, in a world in which rape is acceptable. Because, I mean, actually there are animal species where rape is, is a relatively common mode of reproduction. But then you may evolve in another place in which rape is not okay. It's always totally arbitrary because it's a result of these different natural environments. You may evolve in a place where because of certain natural pressures, uh, cannibalism is perfectly fine. It's an accepted part of the culture. You may evolve in another place where that's, that's not okay. Are you following me? There's no obje objectivity to the morality. So yes, you, you know, maybe science can create different moral experiences, but you, you, so you could say, well, it's right over here and what's right over there is not right over there, but you can never say it's wrong, period. But, but what's right is determined by what causes more of the community to survive. That would be an evolution, that would presumably be, yes, but still there'd be no, there'd be no reference to anything ultimate. So, and, and, and this, so Andrea brings up a good point. So yes, you could say, well, and that would be kind of a utilitarian argument, like, okay, well, we're gonna base morality on what's good for the most amount of people and all that. Okay, that's fine. But what's good for the most amount of people might be euthanizing people with disabilities. Um, Nazism is an expression, certainly could be an expression of pure physical moralism. But here's the problem, nobody lives like that. In other words, if somebody hurts your feelings, you don't say to them, I understand that you have a different moral code than I do, and so I'm gonna let that pass <laughs> because there's no objective morality, so you have your morality, I have my, you say that's wrong, meaning that's always wrong. It's never right. You're appealing to a universal code that says there is such a thing as objective right and wrong. So science, science in the sense that we, that everybody sort of unconsciously uses right and wrong, science can't give us that. All right. Science also can't tell us what the value of a human being is. There have been different cultures through the world that have given us different definitions. I do a lot of reading in um, Roman history because that was the milieu in which Christianity uh, first emerged. The Romans had a much different view of human value than we do. <laughs> they had a very stratified society. If you were not a Roman, you basically had no value. They, they had an enormous slave class. Uh, Romans could do whatever they wanted to those. They, when they conquered people and they called them barbarians, they were worse than useless. I mean, they had their view of, they did not think that all human beings had the same value. That is a distinct Christian view. So there are differences in this question through time and through culture. Uh, we, you know, our view is based in scripture. God created people and created them in his own image. So we believe people have inherent worth, but that is, that is not something science could tell us. Am I making sense in talking about this? Okay. I mean, one, one, um, one scientist I heard talking about this said, what science can tell you is if you boiled a person down, what would their chemicals be worth? That's what science could tell you. Well, there, you know, you have a certain amount of carbon, you could sell that, you have a certain amount of, what, you know, whatever. 
Um, that's about as much as science could tell you about the worth of a human being. Now, I just want you to know that this is not just me saying this as a Christian minister. So Richard Dawkins, obviously preeminent uh, evolutionary biologist, this is what he says in the naturalistic frame of, frame of mind. He says, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Right. Because if the answer is yes, that's wrong. Right. I think, I think you make an interesting point, and I think what a lot of people would say is that we're living on the fumes of, of a Judeo-Christian belief system. So we're still acting as if it's true, even though intellectually we say it's not true. You know? Or we'll, or we'll yeah. take a little bit of time for people to say it's such a time of change that people, but philosophically, conflate sometimes chance and uh, confusion and change with chaos. Philosophically, are very different. Really, our lives are very ordered. We're, you know, if we take this chair and put it, we're going to sit on it. We're living in tremendous order. Right. Whether I'm aware, I may feel totally confused, totally confused about life. Sometimes I even do. But the world I'm around is, is totally ordered. I'm going to get in my car, turn on the key, go from there. Very ordered. I don't, think, really ordered. I don't think indifference is the same as disorder. Like, he's not saying everything's chaos, he's just saying. He's just arguing that there's no guiding light from mm -hmm. beyond us. There's just our ability to make order in the face of an indifferent and, natural yeah. world. So, and that, right, mm -hmm. I totally agree. And, but, however, though, the question someone asked for that is that, are you saying that all the order is um, pure luck, has no, mm -hmm. just, has, is beyond order itself, that the causes of order are beyond order itself? That's the philosophical principle. That's also contrary to science, by the way. Of course, it's a, but it's a philosophical error. Mm -hmm. It is powerful. Well, there's, a, there's social order. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think both of you make good points. I mean, because Dawkins would actually say there is order in the world because evolution creates order, but it's not based in a creator. In other words, he, say, he often says it looks like, he's like, there is design and it looks like it was designed by a creator, but it's not. I also think it's worth noting that evolution doesn't exist without disorder. You know, survival of the fittest is predicated on the chance that there will be errors in genetic replication, that there's going to be disorder, there's going to be chaos. And the only possible way that we survive as a species, that anything survives, is that there is disorder and that there is chaos. And that's what leads us to evolution, mm -hmm. the ability to survive over time. Right. Right. And real quick, you're saying it is staying in But he did, what I talk about is he's saying there's no design. No purpose, no causality. Right, or right. Ever, I'm getting this word. Yeah, I think, yeah, right. He says no design. When he says no design, he means there's no mind behind it intentionally doing this. It's random. No causality. Yeah, yeah. Have to, yeah. No causality. Yeah. That's a tricky yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, Bill, there was a slide that I didn't mention, which I'll mention now. Um, so. C.S. Lewis observed men became, he's talking about the scientific revolution in Europe. Why, why did this come out of a specifically Christian milieu? He said men became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in a legislator. Right. And so, and, and there's, this is an area where it's easy to get bogged down in the weeds about this, yeah. but there's been some really interesting work done in the last few years about the reasons why the theological assumptions in Christian Europe led to a scientific revolution when it didn't happen in other places in the world. And one of them is that people, because they were so immersed in biblical history, they understood God as a God who, in, who provides laws. And so when they were looking out in the world, they were expecting to find that. Yeah. And now if, you, if you're in a polytheistic society, that's, you're not gonna be, you're gonna be thinking, well, there's Zeus and he's fighting with Poseidon and Athena's over here turning people into spiders. And it's like, it's, you know, you're not gonna be thinking here's an orderly universe out there and I can expect to find rational laws, right? But that's kind of, this is a rabbit hole, which I don't wanna, I'm, I'm interested in it. We can talk about it, but I don't wanna 
it, we could easily spend a whole day talking about that. So I wanted to kind of finish this. So this was the myth that there are no limits to scientists, to science. The second myth that I think a lot of people accept is that, well, you know, science is based in evidence. There's no faith involved. And religion is the opposite. Religion is just based in faith, really not evidence. Does that make sense? So I would like to suggest, and I want to spend a little time talking about this, that science is based in evidence and faith, and so is religion. That they both use evidence and faith, and they both require evidence and faith. And I want to do it by sort of combating the common misconceptions. So everybody knows that faith is involved in religion. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to show you why there's actually evidence involved in religion as well. And I'm, I will be speaking from my perspective as a Christian minister. I can't speak to other religions, but I can tell you that in the Bible, evidence is extremely important. I'll give you a few examples. So, and this is just, <laughs> this, is, this is the common view that, that these, are, these are opposing ideas when actually I think they always go hand in hand. Okay, so, um, oh, and here's Richard Dawkins saying, faith is belief that isn't based on evidence, that's a principle based on religion. So Dawkins clearly believes this. Um, but let's look at the Gospel of Luke. So the Gospel of Luke was written by, we think, a Gentile, perhaps a, a physician, which means someone who's actually interested in the natural world, and also somebody who's very interested in, in investigating the world. He, was, he wrote both Luke and Acts as kind of a, a letter to his patron whose name was Theophilus. And in the introduction to Luke, this is what he says. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself has, have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth of the things that you have been taught. So people will often say, well, religion is just a fairy tale. Fairy tales begin once upon a time. Fairy, fairy tales do not begin. I have carefully investigated the evidence and I want to give you a report based on the eyewitness accounts that I have found. It's a totally different approach. And what I want to say is that you can dispute the evidence, that's fair. We can have a conversation about that and I'd be happy to talk about, you know, what is the historical evidence for uh, the Gospels and when they were written versus the evidence for other historical figures, Plato, Julius Caesar, anybody. And I think the Gospels hold up exceedingly well in that context. But you can't say, oh, Christians just believe whatever people tell them, they don't really care about evidence. Because from the very beginning, the Bible was set out as a series of truth statements based in investigation. Um, Here's another thing, this is Paul, this is even earlier. So Paul, one of the reasons why the, why the New Testament is so, I think, historically strong is because Paul was writing letters within 20 years of Jesus' resurrection. Remarkably quick. He is writing to the church in Corinth and he says, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. This is a really important part of this, most of whom are still living. He's telling the Corinthians, there are people out there that you can talk to right now. Go talk to them. They're still alive. So again, you can say, you can dispute the evidence, but what you can't say is that Paul didn't care about the evidence. He cared so much that he wanted the Corinthians to base their faith on, on these reports that could be verified. Now I think, um, I think it gets back to what Bill was saying, the question of faith, what is faith? And again, I feel like this is gonna be unnecessary considering the crowd. I was kind of thinking maybe there'd be some people who would push back on me a little bit, but I'll go ahead and give you the presentation I was, I was imagining. Um, because I think it's, this is, what, what, what's that? We'll find something. Okay. Um, because I think that when people criticize religion and they criticize faith, they're really talking about blind faith. And I think that's a fair criticism. We should criticize blind faith. Um, and I'm going to tell you why I don't think that's what we practice in the church. So this is uh, John 20. At the end of his gospel, John's explaining why he wrote this story about Jesus. And he told people all of these, you know, miracle accounts and the resurrection story. He says, this is why I wrote this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now this word believe, sometimes it's translated faith, and the Greek word is pistis. 
it does not mean blind faith. If you look at the, the you know, Greek concordances, the definition of pistis is trust, confidence, reliability. They're not saying we want you to believe something blindly. They're saying we've shown you all this evidence. Now we want you to trust it. Reliability. Reliability. Fact-based. Fact -based. Now here's, here's my analogy. So my wife's in the back of the room. Uh, we've been married for a long time, 15, 16 years this year, I guess. Six, 16 in June. And um, I, I think it's, a, I support marriage. I encourage it. And uh, here's what I didn't do. I didn't run out in the road and find somebody and say, will you marry me? Rebecca and I were friends for several years. Uh, we were testing each other. We were gathering evidence. Who is this person? What are they like? What are they like in different situations? What, is, what are their friends like? What are their families like? Do we have similar values? All these things. We, that was the evidence gathering stage of our relationship. But there does come a point in any relationship where you have to make a decision. Are you going to trust them or not? And here's the interesting thing about this. When you trust somebody, when you make that decision, which is, it's always risky, it is a leap of faith. You don't, you don't know if it's gonna work out. You do take, it's an educated risk, but it's a risk. That trust that you choose opens up new avenues of knowledge that you would not have had if you didn't make that choice. Which means if you don't have trust, there's a limit to how much you can know intellectually. Does this make sense to people? This has always been a part of the Christian tradition. Augustine put it this way, credo ut intelligem, I believe, so that I may understand. And on its face, that sounds counterintuitive, but Augustine was a brilliant guy, knew all of the Greco-Roman philosophers, practiced other religions before Christianity. He gathered evidence, and then he said, okay, I have to trust. And on the basis of that trust, I'm seeking to know more. And Anselm, who uh, about 700 years later put it slightly differently, he said it's faith-seeking understanding. Does that make sense? Okay, I think this is a really important point because um, I think this is how faith often works and people don't understand it. The question now is does science also involve faith? We know science involved evidence, I'm gonna give you that. Does science involve faith? I say it does and I'm gonna give you three reasons why. Number one, faith in hypotheses. So the basic scientific method involves kind of similar to that story I told about getting married. You first you gather a lot of evidence and on the basis of that evidence you say I have an idea about what I think might be true that nobody has known before. I'm going to test it out. But you have to invest yourself in that. Scientists invest a lot of themselves. They trust that hypothesis. They have to believe it's true. If you don't believe it's true, how are you going to go through the months and years of Lack, lack of funding and people who probably tell you you're wrong and all the rest of it. I mean, their history is littered with scientists who lived and died believing things that weren't necessarily true, but they believed in them. And that faith is necessary in order to do the work of science. Does that make sense? So that's, that's the first way that I think faith um, is really important in the scientific method. The second way is paradigm shifts. So this is a phrase from Thomas Kuhn, who was a philosopher of scientist. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions in 1962, and he created this term paradigm shift. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with this term. And what he said is that um, science tends to create a culture around it. So when you're, when you're coming up, and Russ and Karen, I'd love to hear what you think about this, but when you're in school and you're learning, a lot of that is based on trust. You're trusting your teachers to give you good information. But you're also being inculcated into a certain culture that accepts all of this knowledge to be true. No scientist can study everything. There's too much information out there. So you have to accept on the basis of trust what other scientists have learned before you. You enter into a paradigm and that is really good because it creates efficiency and knowledge can build on itself. But what happens if the paradigm is wrong? Well, sometimes, like in the case of Copernicus, they had to re <laughs> just redo everything. Oh, the Earth is not the center of the universe? Well, we have to start from scratch. The, now the sun is the center of the universe. This happens sometimes through history, and it means that all this faith you place in a certain paradigm tends to be misplaced. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that, it, that you can't know it intellectually. It's, it, your relationship to it is through faith. And there's a great quote, Max Planck. He says, science advances one funeral at a time. <laughs> Because you, those scientists in that paradigm have to die sometimes before 
people who operate outside that paradigm can come in with new ideas. And there's a lot of examples of this, but the one I want to share with you today I think is particularly pertinent because it involves religion, and it's the uh, paradigm of the Big Bang. So a, a lot of people don't know that the Big Bang is actually a pretty recent development. Really was only accepted in the mid 20th century. Before then, most sci before then, most scientists believed in a static universe. The universe doesn't move. It's just, it's there, you know, it, it, and it also, it's, it's, it's eternal. It's always been there. It is the size it is. The size is not changing. It's always been there. And um, then in the early part of the 20th century, some astronomers started to notice this thing called the red shift of galaxies. So they would look through these new telescopes and they would see the galaxies were receding from us. And they could tell that by the light waves and the, the red shift as they were leaving. And they noticed that galaxies that were further away were receding faster than the galaxies closer to us, which indicates an expanding universe. Um, well, it turned out that the guy that really worked this out was a Belgian priest named George uh, Lemaitre. He was the first person to take this information and form this theory of, he didn't call it the Big Bang, he called it um, the primeval atom. And that from this primeval atom, there was an explosion and the universe was created that way. The Big Bang was a derisive term termed by this guy, Fred Hoyle, who hated the idea. He was an atheist, uh, astrophysicist in England. He hated the idea of this. And so he went on the BBC and he said, I just think this idea of like there was a Big Bang and that name stuck. So now we call it the Big Bang. He hated it because it affirmed the Bible story of creation that there was a beginning. Because if the universe has always been around, then obviously Genesis is wrong. God created the world, right, and called it good. That indicates that there was a moment in time in which the universe did not exist. God created it, it did exist. He hated this idea and he fought him for years and years and years. And even to the end of his life, he, didn't, he wouldn't admit that he believed the Big Bang. He advocated this idea of called what the steady state universe uh, theory. Even Einstein resisted this idea and he had a meeting with George Lemaitre and in that meeting, he said, the entire deal resembles too much the book of Genesis. We easily see that you were a priest. <laughs> now, later Einstein changed his mind because he saw the redshift pattern and he had to admit that this was happening. But here's my point. There was a paradigm that was accepted uncritically by scientists who had placed their faith in this paradigm. It was very hard to change that paradigm. Am I making sense here, Why, how there is an element of faith that's, that exists in scientific work? This is a kind of a funny quote. Uh, this astronomer named Robert Jastrow is sort of joking about how hard it was for people to admit that the Big Bang happened. He said, for the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians <laughs> who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> So it's not often that we are right. So I like to take advantage of this when it, when it happens. Um, part three. So we've looked at, you know, the, again, we're looking at the way faith might operate within the world of science. So we've looked at paradigm shifts. We've looked at hypotheses. And now I want to talk a little bit about scientific discovery. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. There's a piece of paper I need over here. So how are scientists? how are scientific discoveries made? And I think a lot of people just assume that science is such a left brain activity that people are just crunching numbers in a laboratory and that's how they come up with new ideas. You'd be shocked at how creative and imaginative the process of scientific discovery is. There was a great article by Garrett Vashur called The Thrill of Discovery. And he's talking about how when scientists make these new discoveries, it's, they feel this elation that's extraordinary. It's the best moment of their life, but they don't want to admit it to anybody because it's such a right-brained phenomenon. And I just want to read this. He's, he, he interviewed people for this article. Nobody would give their real name. They didn't want anybody to know what had happened to them. But he tells this story. He says, an astronomer recently spent years analyzing data related to the structure of the spiral arms in the Milky Way. Day after day, he worked at it. Then suddenly it happened. One day, I heard the galaxy, he told me excitedly. I hesitate to admit it, but I heard the music. He stared at me, wondering if I would think him crazy. I could hear the music of the spiral arms. They have motion within them, and I could hear it. It was an incredible feeling. I understood. 
He confessed that it was the greatest moment of his life, but that he could not tell his colleagues and wasn't optimistic that anything as wonderful would ever happen to him again. Then he had to confront the astronomer's next great challenge. After the elation wore off, he had to write a report on his research. Today, his neatly rational paper on the structure of the spiral arms rests between the covers of a journal. The report makes no mention of his moment of profound insight, nor the music. So he has this mystical experience, which allows him to find out new things about reality, and he doesn't tell anybody, because it doesn't seem scientific. So we have to ask, how are these discoveries made? And when you look at the people who have really probed and really stretched you know, our understanding of the universe, like Einstein, he says, the intellect has little to do on the road to discovery. There comes a leap in consciousness, call it intuition or what you will. The solution comes to you and you don't know how or why. It's fascinating, isn't it? And we have these uh, letters from his wife where she talked about how he would work and she said he would kind of wander around the house deep in thought. He would stop and he would play violin. He loved the violin. And he would play music for a while and then he would spend some more time thinking. And it was a very kind of pensive, imaginative process that he went through. He was not sitting there crunching numbers. He was trusting something called intuition, which nobody knows what it is. What the heck is intuition? Is it even based in anything physical or is it something more spiritual? Einstein had to have faith in it. That's faith. That's trusting something that you can't understand. Nikola Tesla put it more directly. He said, my brain is only a receiver. In the universe, there is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know that it exists. So he's being a lot more explicit, saying this intuition is coming to me from a source, probably something that we would probably call God. OK. so. Third myth, science is gradually disproving the possibility of God. I think this is the God of the gaps argument like Andrea brought out that, well, the more we know about science, the less it's possible to believe in God. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of why I think exactly the opposite is, tr is true. The opposite would be the more we learn about science, the more we know that God is real. Wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> so a couple of things. The first is the fine tuning of the universe. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with this idea. The last 100 years as scientists have been able to kind of measure the actual constants, the, the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, all of these different forces which are, are working in, with matter in the universe. They've discovered that they are so finely balanced that it's almost difficult to describe. That if you, if you moved any of these values, the tiniest fraction of an amount, life never would have happened. The universe never would have been created. Certainly human life never would have been created. You know, you, either gravity would have been too strong and the universe would have flown apart and never come back together or it would have collapsed immediately and never would have got started in the first place. And we're talking, about the, the levels at which we're talking are so precise, they boggle the mind. Here's one example. For a life permitting universe to exist, the possible range of gravitational forces is one part in 10 to the 60. The likelihood of this happening accidentally is one chance in one trillion, 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 trillion. Does that make sense? So if you had a dial with 10 to the 60 notches on it, and that represented the gravitational force in the universe, and you moved it one, you wouldn't have life at all. It has to be perfect. You think this is impressive. Roger Penrose, who is an astronomer in England, he's done a lot of work on the early conditions of the Big Bang. And I'm going to be a little bit out of, I don't, over my skis here. I might need some help. But he's talked about how, the, how there had to be extremely low level of entropy uh, for the Big Bang to happen. And he says the probability of that specific low entropy level being present before the Big Bang is 1 over 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. Now, that number is so astonishingly large. He said it would be impossible to write out in a usual decimal way because even if you were able to put a zero on every particle in the universe, there would not be enough particles to do the job. So that is one argument for this idea that it just doesn't seem likely that the universe was created by accident. Now, a lot of people are aware of this. In fact, I'll share with you, I'm intentionally showing you quotes here from atheists, because I want you to know this is not just some Christian talking point. So 
Michael Turner, astrophysicist at the University of Chicago. He says the precision is as, as if one could throw a dart across the entire universe and hit a bullseye one millimeter in diameter on the other side. Fred Hoyle, remember Fred Hoyle, coined the Big Bang? Did, he would, is the la last person who would like to admit that the universe was created by a designer. But he said a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. <laughs> The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. Another atheist, Stephen Hawking, says the remarkable fact is that these value, the values of these numbers, the constants of physics, seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. Pretty amazing, and I'll, I'll just mention that one common approach, because th this is hard for people to talk about. And it's hard to respond to this and advocate a naturalistic point of view. But the way people try to do it is through the multiverse. So you'll hear about this a lot, is they'll say, well, there are an infinite number of universes and we just happen to be in the one that was po made life possible. I mean, that's possible, I guess. But that seems to be a bit of a stretch, I think. I think that a lot of people have pointed out, it seems to be a way of not having to admit or having to come to terms with the fact that this really does, there does seem to be a mind that put all this in place. Yes, Bill. Right. In and of itself, asserting multiverses doesn't assert anything about the probabilities or factors in one. Right. So it's yeah. actually a philosophical error of thought. Well, and it's also true, apparently, again, uh, this is based on what I've read, that those universes would also have to involve some sort of fine tuning. That's, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. it's, you, you don't really get out of the problem, even though it seems to. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying the remarkable fact that right. so he's assuming that the rest of what he's saying is factual. I, right. You know, it's just science. I mean, I think this is a scientific statement, <laughs> unlike but, but, I, the yeah. statement there is no God. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a, okay, okay. Um, so that's one argument where science, the more we learn about science, it might actually reinforce our faith. There's a second one which is the reliability of the human mind. This is gonna be a little more abstract, but I thought I should mention it because it's, it's an important idea. We're gonna talk more about it next week when we talk about consciousness. But the idea is that if you take a purely naturalistic point of view, it's hard to have confidence in the very mind that gives you your beliefs. So Einstein said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Here's, here's the argument. So, Let's take natural selection, evolution, naturalism seriously for a minute. Everything is accidental and random, which means the brain is accidental and random. It could have wound up a lot of different ways. It just happened that we wound up with the brains we have. But remember, evolution is based on survival. That's what is always selected for, right? It's, it's about adaptation and survivability. It's not adaptation based on true beliefs. And I think as we all know, True beliefs aren't necessarily the ones that are good for survival, right? A survival would be, I'm going to kill everybody. Or, you know, I'm better than other people, I'm going to kill the weak. Or any, any number of beliefs that you could believe would really help you to survive. It certainly doesn't help you to love your enemies to survive. That would be exactly the opposite of that, right? So if, if natural selection is a purely random, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but if it's a purely random process, how can we trust the mind that it is created to give us true, a true understanding of the world? Is this, it's a little abstract, bear with me here, but this is something that a lot of people have talked about. So even Darwin himself talked about this. He said, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? It's abstract because what it does is it makes you 
doubt the very statements that you believe are true. So Darwin, if, he, if this is true, he would have to say the very theory of evolution that he's created with his brain is questionable because it's based on a random process. It's not based on any kind of a God who would endow things, minds with his own ability to see the truth. Are you following me? Um, it, a couple other quotes that just sort of reinforce this. Uh, scientists at Cambridge said, for if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the last quote is uh, John Lennox, is a guy that I follow a lot, I really enjoy his perspective. He makes a dramatic claim that, that it's not science and religion that are opposed, it's really science and atheism that are opposed. He says, I reject atheism because I believe Christianity be, to be true, but I also reject it because I'm a scientist. How could I be impressed with a worldview that undermines the very rationality we need to do science? Science and God mix very well. It is science and atheism that do not mix. So again, he's talking about this fact that if you truly take the materialistic worldview to its logical conclusion, you really can't trust the very thoughts you're having because there's no reference to anything true outside of them. Is that making some sense? Okay, last slide, I promise. Uh, I just thought this would be a nice one to end on. Einstein was not a conventionally religious person, but there's no question he was kind of a mystical figure who did believe in some sort of spirit. He said, everyone who is seriously engaged in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that the laws of nature manifest the existence of a spirit vastly superior to that of men, and one in the face of which we with our modest powers must feel humble. And that's my presentation. <laughs> Jim. First of all, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Recorded, I'm likely to go back and watch it again. Yeah. And that last one hit me with something I was thinking about throughout, which is, yeah, yeah for, I guess an atheist, atheistic viewpoint would be we can know it all. We just need to study mm -hmm. enough to, to know it all. Yeah. But I believe scientists have faith because they are always discovering that there's more. Mm -hmm. That they find one thing and but then in finding that one thing they discover there's so much more that they don't mm -hmm. know. And I, I think of you know, first they learned about certain materials, and then they got down to molecules, and then atoms, and then, oops, we can actually go inside, you know, yeah. a proton, and yeah. we don't know what, oh, there's a quark, oh, yeah. and then, oh, but what, what happens when we go inside that, you know, and it's just this constant, elusive, more, there's more and more that now than there yes. was then, yes. and a hundred years from now, there's going to be more and more then, so, yeah. So you're having faith in the ability to do science, that's right. faith that science can unfold that's these things. That's all faith, but, but, but then... But also, you're never going to get there. You're never going to get there, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, I mean, if I, I, it's kind of an interesting thought experiment. What percentage of reality do we think we understand? <laughs> one? Less than one percent, maybe? I mean, it's, we don't know. I mean, I'd be curious to know what people think. How much of reality do we think we actually understand? Uh, <laughs> you need five? That's okay, five percent. All right, five percent. Well, I mean, that's interesting because 95 percent of the universe is dark matter, which we have no idea what it is. So, so five percent is pretty, pretty generous, We've I think. But, yeah. We've never even been deep maybe on our own planet. Yeah. Yeah, Bill. One of the things that illustrated this for me a while ago, years ago, I saw it was an article in National Geographic um, using an electron microscope and other satellites and stuff like that, but it was looking at what we normally perceive as the chaotic aspects of nature. And they sh illustrated every phenomenon that if you look at it on a surface and it looks chaotic, when you drill down on it, there's actually rhyme and reason in it. And one of the great examples, I think, is they study schools of fish and bird flocks, and now take time-lapse pictures, and they create patterns that are logical. There are reasons for this. It's not just a school of 100,000 mm -hmm. fish mm -hmm. wandering through the ocean. I mean, and you can look at everything, the way plants
planets grow, the way our Earth is structured, the, the atomic, you know, the atomic universe. It's it, on the surface, it may look random and chaotic, but every time, and they, and they illustrated it with, with pictures uh, from an electron microscope, from satellites, and it was just eye-opening. I mean, it was astounding <coughs> to me, and it, it, I just think we're discovering more and more of that mm -hmm. as we look into it. My reaction to just these last couple of slides was mm -hmm. in terms of coming up over the mountain and then realizing the yogis have been sitting there is you're sort of rediscovering Descartes as well, right? I, I, I can't possibly know anything except that I'm here wondering what's out there. Mm -hmm. And what, you know, how, how do I get from here to something real? Okay. We'll talk about Descartes a little bit next week when yeah. we talk about consciousness. Right. <laughs> and he woke up and he had it. Right. Sure. Well, just to, I mean, so just a teaser, we're talking about the mind, which is in some circles is a bad word because you're supposed to only have a brain. Uh, if you say the word mind, you're sort of implying that there may, might be a non-physical dimension to thought. Mm -hmm. well, but the idea of mind preceded the idea of brain. Well, I mean, I think the question that just responding to Mary Jo is th nobody knows what consciousness is. And I really want to emphasize that fact, that there is nothing more fundamental, I think, to human life than consciousness because it's the very way we understand ourselves and we relate to other people. It's everything, right? Consciousness is our entire experience of everything. Nobody knows what it is. Nobody. It's, it's, a, it's a live conversation. People have ideas, but there's been nobody who's been able to explain, if you're, if you have, if you're a pure naturalist, how physical matter, which is unconscious, has no thoughts, no mental life, could give way to something that is self-conscious. How does that happen? Right. Nobody knows how that could have possibly happened naturally. So we'll talk a little bit about that next week. I mean, neurosurgeon, you're gonna, that's <laughs> topic for you. I'm thinking yeah. so much, you know, my awareness of nuclear energy is the bomb. I was born in 1943, and so by the time I came to consciousness, it was something that we worried about. Yeah. Um, but then you get to neuroscience for the good. Yeah. Well, listen, I don't want to uh, keep it everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'll hang around if anybody has any questions. Thanks. <laughs>